So we've been going through a series in the book, uh, in the letter of 1 Corinthians. This is Paul writing to the Corinth church. He's kind of been going around the neighborhood of the Roman Empire, meeting people, and, and these communities start forming. And then he says, hey, why don't you guys gather and do this thing called church, ecclesia? And uh, then, sure enough, um, stuff happens, conflict, problems. So he's writing these letters addressing some of these issues. And we've been looking at that in the context of a, an urban setting because the church in Corinth is really a melting, melting pot of diversity, cultures, and people. And in, in some ways, I think there are things that we can learn from the Corinth church. Um, and today, I wanted to start off with kind of a, a ser- somewhat serious note and saying that as we look at our text today, I want us to think in the mindset not of like me preaching to you and, and you hearing stuff. But um, I wanted to use the word uh, to meditate on our passage today. And, and I say that because, you know, I believe, and as a church, we believe that this is a living, breathing text. That it has the ability to be the vehicle through which God speaks into our lives. And, and one of the kind of ancient and current spiritual traditions is this idea of meditating on God's Word. And so even though I'm going to do most of the talking, I I hope that today we are engaged as a group, as a community, and as an individual in meditating on God's Word and really saying, God, what do you have? Holy Spirit, what is is it that you want to speak into uh, into my life today. So with that, let me pray before I read our passage. Father, we ask that in these ancient texts written to a group of people in a faraway place in Corinth that you wrote through your Apostle Paul, we ask your Holy Spirit as we meditate on these words, would you breathe on us? that in you we live, move, and have our being. And all God's people said, Amen. All right, so um, I wanted to do, as a professor, you know, you got to have more books, right? So so I have two books um, that I wanted to use as kind of a, a lens, a filter, if you use Instagram, you know, it's all about filters, right? You can't just put up pictures up there. You got to put out cool filters. But it helps us to kind of see, see it in, in new ways. And so these are two books and ideas that I, I want us to look at our text today. And one is, this is uh, called Perspectives, but really I want to focus on kind of the person that started this this theme, and it's this guy named Ralph Winters. And if you've never heard of him, he is a giant in the 20th century, really transformed how churches did missions. And I think it was in the 70s, he went to a missions conference, and he basically said, hey, we're doing this all weird. We're looking at missions and sending people to countries where we should be really focusing on people groups and not geographic boundaries. And it's even more pertinent today uh, because the people groups and the nations are right around us. And so he has this really tremendous um, diagram that he, uh, he kind of formulates. And today I'm really going to reduce it. And so if, if you are an expert in this and I have really butchered it, you know, please uh, let me know and I'll try to correct it. But basically he does this, um, he calls it like cultural distance. So he says, you know, when a missionary goes out and he wants to talk about the good news of Jesus, 
you know, you just can't go out there and do it because there's these barriers, cultural barriers like language. So you imagine you go somewhere and you don't speak the language and you say, you know, Jesus loves you and they look at you like, who's that fool out there? Just like screaming around doing weird things. Um, see, I think it's like this. Zero, one, two, three. So he kind of imagines like if you're a church, and it's a terrible picture, but um, he says if you're at uh, the zero zone, he says it's kind of like you're, you're within the church culture boundaries. So you speak the same language, may eat the same food. Really, you have the same interest in cultural uh, distinctness. There's no distance there. You may look different, but really the culture is the same. Then when you get out to um, zone one, then you, you start to have some distinct barriers. Like these people don't hang out at church. So you, you may be picturing some of this in your mind, right? These, these may be your coworkers, your neighbors that don't go to church. Um, may, maybe even have negative views about what church is. Can't do Christian lingo. You know, it's like, I'm so blessed today for what God has done. They're like, what are you talking about, right? Um, zone two, when you get out here, this, now you're, you're getting into a really difficult situation where the cultural barriers are multiple to, to the point where you're not, probably not even speaking the same language. And there's a point where your, our cultural distinctness will actually become hindrances to uh, hearing the gospel. And so he does another thing, um, and I won't do this one because he has another one called the P scale, which is how far potential believers have to go to become Christians. And in, in that in that direction here, in this category, this group has to pay a tremendous price to move in this direction. And so uh, some ways to think about that is, um, for example, like in areas like in the Middle East. If you are culturally Muslim and you've grown up in that culture, in that language, in that ethos, and you hear the gospel and the Holy Spirit moves you and you decide, I think this is true and I want to be a follower of Jesus. They can't just do that with no cost. They will lose their entire community and family. And that's a decision that they have to make. And so he, he talks about these zone and zone three is where there is actually no infrastructure. They have never heard of anything called the church. There's no language or no concept about the faith or Christian ideas or who Jesus is or the gospel. And so in these two, three zones, generally he talks about um, starting an indigenous movement because you're not going to take this church and stick it here, right? What, what missionaries try to do is over here, they try to raise up indigenous people that will become the leaders that will have a distinct flavor for what that church looks like. Because obviously, if we could physically lift up St. Moses, we wouldn't then transplant it over to in Uzbekistan. I don't know why that, that's the first country that came up to mind, or, or even North Korea. It just wouldn't work. I mean, you and I, just common sense, you think, well, that's silly. We would never do that. I raise this up because as we read 1 Corinthians, in some ways we kind of read it like, like this at best, maybe zone one here. But you know, Paul operates mainly over here. In fact, there was really not anything really called this concept institution as a church, probably until like the fourth century. Um, so historian buffs, you know, there's this guy named Emperor Constantine and he sees this vision of a cross, he goes into battle and he wins and he says, hey, 
I'm going to bring this faith in that I have heard from my mother, and I'm going to make it bam, smack dab central right in my empire. And then we get a shift, right? The church now becomes the em empire's power and authority. And from that over 1,600, <laughs> seven, doing bad math, right? you get my point, right? It has evolved into these tremendous traditions, which are very beautiful. But, but we are tempted to read scripture like this. And I want us to broaden our lens. And when we do that, it starts to look a little different. So let me read. I should wrap up now. Because <laughs> our, our text is real long. So um, I'm not going to touch on all of it, but you get, you get the, the flavor of it as I read through the entire thing. So here's 1 Corinthians chapter 14, um, verse 1 through 25. Listen to the word of God. Let love be your highest goal, but you should also desire the special gifts of the Spirit uh, that the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. Um, for if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God. Um, since people won't be able to understand you, you will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will be mysterious. But one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. I wish you could all speak in tongues. But even more, I wish you would all prophesy. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues unless someone interprets what you are saying so that the whole church will be strengthened. Dear brothers and sisters, if I should come to you speaking in an unknown language, how would that help you? But if I bring you a revelation or some special kind, special knowledge or prophecy or teaching, that will help you. That will be helpful. Even lifeless instruments like the flute or the harp must play the notes clearly or no one will recognize the melody. And if the bugler doesn't sound a clear call, how will the soldiers know they are being called to battle. It's the same for you. If you speak to people in words they don't understand, how will they know what you are saying? You might as well be talking into empty air. There are many different languages in the world, and every language has meaning, but if I don't understand a language, I will be a foreigner to someone who speaks it. And the one who speaks, it will be a foreigner to me. And the same is true for you. Since you are eager, so eager to have the special abilities uh, the Spirit gives, seek those that will strengthen the whole church. So anyone who speaks in tongues should pray also for the ability to interpret what has been said. For if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying, but I do not understand what I'm saying. Well then, what shall we do? I pray in the Spirit, I will also pray in words I understand, and I will sing in the Spirit, and I will also sing in words I understand. For if you praise God only in spirit, how can those who don't understand you praise God along with you? How can they join you in giving thanks when they don't understand what you're saying? You will be giving thanks very well, but it won't strengthen the people who hear you. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. But in a church meeting, I would rather speak five understandable words to help others than 10,000 words in an unknown language. Dear brothers and sisters, don't be childish in your understanding of these things. Be innocent as babies when it comes to evil, but be mature in understanding matters of this kind. And it is written in scripture, I will speak to my own people through strange languages and through the lips of foreigners, but even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So you see that, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> so you see that speaking in tongues is a sign not for believers, but unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for the benefit of believers, not unbelievers. Even so, if unbelievers or people who don't understand these things come into your church church meeting and hear everyone speaking in an unknown language, 
they will think you are crazy. But if, but if all of you are prophesying and unbelievers or people who don't understand these things come into your meeting, they will be convicted of sin and judged by what you say as they listen their secret thoughts will be exposed and they will fall to their knees and worship God, declaring God is truly here among you. Amen. So, that, that's a long passage. I'm, I'm really going to do kind of, a, kind of a macro view of it. Um, and... Um, and the... the, the Kind of the overarching uh, context and theme of this really begins in chapter 12, 13, and then this is wrapping up in 14. And Paul begins with this um, conflict um, issue with spiritual gifts in the church. And so he, right off the bat in chapter 12, he says, first off, you know, let's be clear, this is a gift from the Holy Spirit to build up, to edify the church. And so he lists all of these different gifts. And then in chapter 13, he kind of does a, a sidetrack poetry into the theology of love that really binds this whole thing. And then he returns back in chapter 14 again. And, and here he was really focusing on, on tongues and interpreting um, tongues and prophecy. But the point here is not whether tongues or, or interpreting prophecies, is, is there's some sort of hierarchy, like we're, we're getting into semantics or, or arguments about you know, whether tongues is better or prophecy is better. You know, it, we, we take a step back and we look at this entire passage from this lens and you see what Paul is getting at. Um, he's focused on the fact that the Corinth church is at a very pivotal point as a community. And they're going to decide to go in this direction as their community culture starts to solidify. Or they're going to go in this direction. Paul has a very clear direction that he wants all of the community of believers to go. And it's in his DNA. It is to, to go out, to be sent out, to be a community where there is the ability for others who have not heard of the, the good news and gospel to always be hospitable. He's very clear that any, any culture that hardens, that prohibits that, is very against it. Because you see his mindset, right? I, I just wanted to... i got so much paper here. This is my childhood Bible. So, you know, growing up, it's like, you got to protect God. So I bought this thing that protects the Bible. Um, so it's not that big. But, you know, growing up, I would always look at the back. So if you grew up in the church and you have a Bible, there's always these little maps. And so I would look at the maps, and it's like, oh, this is... Uh, North and South Israel split in the tribes. And, and then um, you get to um, Paul's missionary trips. So, I mean, you can't see it. I, just use your imagination, right? So one of the things that I had a problem is later on I realized I was slightly colorblind, right? I'm not full colorblind. Like I can see colors. I just have, I think it's called like a red green deficiency. So green and brown, not so good. All right, so am I wearing green and brown? <laughs> um, so if you see me wearing funky colors, probably that. So that means Esther didn't check up on me before I left the house. <laughs> but so the, the thing that always got me was that in the back where Paul, he had, they generally would break it down into Paul had three missionary trips around the empire. And for some reason, they always use red and a green and a brown. And I'm like, well, which one's which? When, where did he, which was the first trip and second? So, you know, I would stare at it. And then later on, the 
the profoundness is that this dude went around the entire known world in his lifetime because there was a there was a burden there was a burden in his life after he met Jesus that said you can't just stay here I think some of you know this right if you have encountered the beauty and truth of who Jesus is it's crushing like you're personhood is crushed and I remember the first time I got it and mind you I my my dad is a pastor so I grew up in the church but you know that doesn't mean anything right I think it was at, later on in, in high school and college it hit me that there is a God who sent his only son to go and become a king where everybody adores him and just, you know, um, red carpet everywhere and like, welcome, thank you. No, that's not it, right? No, he sent his son and the son got crushed. Nobody welcomed him. They all said, hey, we like what you're doing. And then Jesus says, hey, you know what, uh, what you really got to do to have life and follow me is all of these things that you don't want to do. And people said, no, it's not for me. No, thanks. To the point where it got to the point they took Jesus and killed him. But all of that was for me, for you. And then Jesus talks about his, with his disciples the night before he gets crushed. He says, guess what? As the Father has sent me, so I send you to go. I think it's called the, uh, the Great Commission, right? Go, make disciples in my name. And then he, he even talks, it's like almost a Trinitarian formula, right? Father sends the Son, Son sends the disciples, and Jesus says, I will, and my Father will send the Holy Spirit to you. It's in the DNA of God. There is this movement. And Paul got it. I got this tremendous good news, and I cannot keep it. How can I do that? What kind of selfish person does that? Well, he doesn't say that. So he goes and goes again and goes again and finally his life is expired. But all that he was, all that he could, there is a movement and a push. And here he is in Corinth bringing that good news and what does the Corinth church do? Dang. Right? We got the spiritual gifts. Holy Spirit has given me power. In chapter 12, it talks about teaching and prophesying and healing and serving and all of these things. And they go, ooh, Holy Spirit power for me. And then Paul says, what are you doing? Right? It's not for you. It's to build up the community, the church, the body, and out. Always out, right? Chapter 14, 12 to 14, and in fact, I would, I would argue all of Paul's letters is a, a, a message about don't take God's message and wrap it and then calcify it into your culture because that's the natural movement of humanness, right? I think Ian talks about this, right? He said, the, the natural entropy of the world is that walls fall down, right? You see that in Baltimore. Houses that have been abandoned for years, they start to crumble. 
But humanity, the natural entropy of humanity culturally is to raise up. If we are not careful, the walls start to go up automatically. That's what calcified culture does. It starts to build up and say, I got mine. I like this. It's pretty good. Nothing bad with it, right? I think St. Moses is great. But if we are not careful, these natural walls start to come up. And Paul saw that in the Corinth church. He said, something's not going right. You're haggling over tongues. Who's got more spiritual gifts and power? And, and, and Paul's rebuke of them of prophetic interpretation is to pull them away. And, and look at the trajectory of what he's talking about. If it does not build up, if it does not let others outside hear what you're doing, then it doesn't work. It goes back to chapter 13. All of this is nothing. So, um, I wrote this down. It's like, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. I don't know why I wrote that down. <laughs> but, uh, so, we may be getting to a point where, like, oh, man, this, this Sunday is like kind of a Debbie Downer, right? There's no Debbies here, right? Samuel Downer. Um, sometimes we need to hear the depths of our bad news to recognize the heights of our good news. Um, and that's the second lens. I don't know if any of you heard of this guy, Alan Hirsch. I, he, my college roommate um, lives in Chicago, and every so often I get to go out there, and he thinks like I'm Billy Graham or something. So I say, Eddie, I'm not. So he, he uh, set up a meeting with his uh, church pastor, who I didn't know. And so I, I, I'm having coffee with my, my college roommate, Eddie, and this guy walks in. And he's like, oh, how are you? And I'm like, oh, you're in ministry? Oh, yeah, I'm in ministry, too. And, so he like gives me a book and says, I wrote this book, you know, maybe you should read it. I'm like, okay, thanks for the book. And it's, 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 I don't know if you heard this guy named Dave Ferguson. He's in Chicago. Uh, he does community church. And um, later on I found out, I was like, oh my gosh. So I Googled him, like, sorry, Mr. Dave, um, can I continue to talk to you? So he introduced me to this guy, Alan Hirsch, who's really a, kind of a, a missiology, thought-provoking, Genius, Australian, so he's got a funny accent. But he, he's, I think he was a former physician turned marketing ad guru turned Christian. And he um, compiled all these data and surveys. And he, he has other things, but the one that is really impressive is he talks about this thing called 60-40. Um, and so what, what he kind of compiled in all these surveys and data was that, I know this is like poor drawing today, but so imagine if this is the population of the US. You know, what would you say is the, um, the percentage of, of people who say they are Christians and go to church? So you don't have to answer, because uh, if you're embarrassed. So, did, I hear, did I hear 12? Yes. So, um, <laughs> so, you know, depending on your data and, and whatnot, generally they say somewhere between 12 and 18%, which is pretty high, because when you do surveys in Australia and Western Europe, where Christianity has been around for a while, the percentage is astronomically low. Like it's in the 2 to 5% range. So when they look at America, they're like, wow, Christianity is booming over there. But you know, if you're, I don't know if I'm doing the percentage right. So. <laughs> 12 to 18 is pretty woeful, 
All right. But let's just go with that. And so he says, as a, as a community of people with 12 to 18 percent, what do you think is the uh, penetration rate? So he's using, I, I, and I'm, I'm pretending to be a, a marketer. I don't know these lingos, but it sounds good. But he says, what do you think with 12 to 18 percent, the, the kind of uh, ability to influence and outreach and do evangelism and share the gospel, um, what percentage do you think that would look like? Did you say 40? Yes. <laughs> so here's, here's where you get that magical 40 number. So let me see. If we, something like that, right? So that's potential. So that means there's this big slice here, 60% of the pie that's untouched, that he actually says, you have no ability to connect with culture. No ability to make this cultural distance. And, and let, me, let me give you a second to think about this. Is this true? Does, does anecdotal common sense, does this make sense? And probably most of you are like, yeah. Like the neighbors that live around me, the people that I work with, the families that I run into when I drop off my kids, if I were to bring up that I'm a um, follower of Jesus, what would that start to look like? And I don't have to imagine because my wife did this to me. She likes to out me all the time. So um, one of the things that happens in the morning is my, my son um, takes the, the school bus, the cheese bus to school, right? So, you know, we walk over there, there's, there's a stop at the corner, um, and all the, the kids gather, and, and then the bus comes and they go. But there's a little phenomena that happens there. There's like uh, all, the, all the, the parents. So you're kind of eyeing each other, like, do I talk to them, do I not? <laughs> you do like little social mental calculation, like, will I see them more often? Probably not, I'm not going to talk to them. Or you're like, well, my kid seems to be playing with their kid. I probably have to say hi, right? <laughs> so you do these little mental calculations, and so you say hi. And, and I try to keep it like real casual. Like I'm just, I live in the neighborhood. But one time, you know, Esther, my wife, she was there, and she basically was like, they're like, oh, so you live here? And she's like, yeah, I'm, I'm an architect. And my wife is... I mean, my, my husband, he's a pastor. I'm like, why, why do you lead with that? You know, like, why don't you say he likes football or um, he, I don't know, likes coffee or... So, and, and as soon as you lead with that, sometimes you're like, oh. And, but every so often you'll get like this, this look of like, um, I have a virus. Like, like, or sometimes you get like, oh, God, did I curse in front of him? As if, like, <laughs> I have the ability to, to zap you if you, if you um, say curse words. I think most of us, we get this statistic. Um, and I, I bring these two lenses up because... Just like Paul's desire for the Corinth church not to focus on gifts for themselves, but says, hey, this has got to be for the others. In fact, he, he wraps it up in verse 25. He says, so you know when people show up, God is going to do the convicting in their hearts? And then guess what happens? It's like Philippians 2, right? And at the end, every knee will bow and tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. They will say, God is surely here in this place. That's Paul's goal. You know, Paul is not 
happy. And I feel like, I don't want to speak for God, but I think safe to say God is not happy about 40%. God's desire for the, the community of believers, we should not be okay with this. And the good news here is that we don't, this is not our responsibility. God does the work, right? Nowhere does, uh, nowhere does Bible say, Jesus goes, hey, if you do not convert X amount of people, you are not my disciple. Right? Jesus says, you be faithful and you go and, and I'll do the work. Uh, two and a half years ago, June 2016. So yeah, about two and a half years ago, Esther and I, Austin and Ethan, we packed up our stuff, literally, and I was too cheap, so I got a U-Haul. And we packed up our little stuff into a U-Haul van. And again, I like overshot. So I got this massive 20-foot van that was like really hard to drive. And then we shoved it in, and I realized there was so much space. I could have saved $50 and <laughs> gone one model down. Um, And, and uh, so there, there's more backstory to that, but I'll just lead off from there. Um, and, and we had made this decision, let's move to Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> and that process was, um, first of all, it was unfair to my wife because I kept it a secret. So I think this is marriage counseling 101. Don't keep secrets with your spouse. So I had been cheating on her by talking to this guy named Ian for two years. Uh, <laughs> telling her the whole time my, my call to uh, maybe dabble in like urban church setting was really uh, in New York City because we were in the suburbs of New Jersey. The entire state of New Jersey is a suburb. So, uh, so she's cool with that because, you know, she had worked and lived in New York, uh, in Manhattan for, I don't know, 15 years. So she's like, that's cool. It's hip. There's a lot of good food there. Uh, but secretly, I had been talking to this bald man <laughs> with, with the big beard. And, and he had been talking about how um, they had this idea up in, in Towson of trying to do something in the city. And I was like, it's a good idea. should pray more about that. <laughs> yeah, all right? And then he, he did one of these, like, maybe God's calling you to help me come to Baltimore. I'm like, nope. <laughs> Pretty sure that's not God. It's, uh, it's Ian. So, uh, but for, for some reason, um, it, was, it was good companionship. And we were kind of comparing notes and some frustrations of how we were hitting dead walls sometimes and um, some movement, some not. And uh, it got to the point where he was gaining some traction. And, and I think there was a church called Central some of you know, had really put, put their money where their mouth was. And not only resources, but people, people resources. And it was getting serious. And, and his ask of me was getting more serious. And I realized my relationship with Ian was getting more serious. <laughs> so I, I needed to 
to talk to my wife. And mind you, there's something else going on. And I haven't, I'm not sure exactly all of it, but one of it is this idea of as a husband and as a father, even though as a pastor I may not make a lot of money, it was my job to provide for my family. And the thought was, how can I move my family to an unknown quantity, unknown situation? What kind of reckless person does that? God, but right? So I, there was part of me that was, there was a little voice like, Man, you can't do that. That is a jerk move, right? But there was this, there was a sense like, man, it feels really risky, but it seems right. But I don't know, the factors, the, the math doesn't work out. And then, you know, Ian drops a bomb like, hey, you know, all of us, as we uh, start off and, and the staff, you know, we, we'll have the, the honor and privilege of fundraising. I'm like, ugh. Yeah, just really add that cherry on top there. Um, and then other factors were, um, you know, for my family, we moved around a lot. You know, I joked that with my friends, like, um, I would explain, like, where I lived. It's like, yeah, well, we, we immigrated from Korea to Charlottesville, and then, like, three years later, we moved to Austin and then Atlanta, and then I went to Chicago, and they're like, is your dad in the military? I'm like, no, he's a pastor, right? And so for me, like moving was like not a big deal. It just, every three, four years, I was supposed to move. Um, but I realized for, um, for Esther, like she had lived in the same house for, uh, I forget. Don't quote me on numbers, all right? <laughs> I'm not good at math. Like 15 years. And so the concept of, wow, you lived in one place for that long? And, and the, the kind of romantic view of raising our kids in the same area, in the same house, in this stable, rooted place. I love that idea because I think part of me, I wanted that. So I was like, I, I don't want to do this. And so finally, you know, we had this, we had the talk, and I told Esther, and, and I was really scared because in my mind, this is how the conversation went. You know, I thought, da 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 da, right? And then what I would hear back is, what? <laughs> how dare you? I'm so hurt, you know? And what happened in reality was, um, I support you in the decision you make. And I was a little taken aback, like, mm, this is not what I expected. What do you want, right? Uh, <laughs> and she had been praying that um, as she had been working in these companies for years and really building stability and seeing the trajectory of her career, uh, praying one day that um, this image of like letting that go and being okay with it. And I was like, oh, so God has not been just working in me, but in, it's kind of funny how God does that, right? You think God's working and speaking just in your life, but it turns out as you start talking to other people, if you do, that there's similar movements going on. And then another factor kicked in. And for, for some reason, you know, um, we were just talking. And um, like all couples, you start talking about your family. And, and somehow it veered off to the fact that as um, in, in the Korean American circle, we're considered second generation. But I think in the overall context, we're actually first generation immigrants. So my, our parents moving, immigrating to America, they're like 
foreigners, and then their kids are first generation. So, but I don't know. We the the Koreans like did the numbering funny. So um, we were like a second generation. Um, imagining because I I have vague memories of coming here as a kid, as a little kid. The one thing I do remember is like these giant bags, and they're affectionately known as immigrant bags because they, they're about this size, but you unzip them, and then they like, uh, they telescope up, and then they can double in volume. So you just smash everything in there, and I, I don't know how many we had. And um, pulling these things, and as a kid, you know, they were massive. They were like the size of a truck. And this idea of flying to a distant land. And we landed in Seattle, of all places, because it was like a hop, and then into, I think it was LaGuardia. And LaGuardia back then was really rough. <laughs> so we, <laughs> we landed in LaGuardia, and I think somebody picked us up in one of those A-team vans. Um, not like minivans, but like the, the is it conversion vans. and. And I was like, wow, everything here in America really is big. <laughs> and you know, um, all seven of us packed in. And I remember the guy who picked us up gave me a, um, a stick of gum. And I was like, wow, and you get, you get candy all the time. I was like, I love this place. <laughs> um, and I think we must have stayed probably in Long Island City, like underneath the a subway track because all I heard throughout the night were the trains going over and I was like, I don't know if I really like this place. <laughs> and then the, the car alarms kept going off. I'm like, where am I? And then we drove like five hours to Virginia. And, um, and we were greeted with these people I've never met. And they had gotten beds and clothes and furnitures. Um, and, and I remember distinctly getting this little baseball mitten um, glove that to this day I still cherish because it was like, it's like, this is mine. And so um, we were talking about the fact that what would it be like if we, had, we take our two kids and move to another country with a different language, with a different culture. Like, it's unfathomable. God called us here, and, and for some of you, God has called you here, and some of you are looking right now. And, and I think God's calling you, calling all of us, to a movement, to be sent out ones. That's just the, the biblical word for being missional, right? And being sent out has this aspect of you're being sent out to, to hear, to see the needs of others. And as St. Mo's, like Corinth, I think we're, we're at a point where we got some decisions, right? We're going to go in one direction or another. If we do nothing, St. Mo's is going to start slowly collapsing in and calcify and turn into a really nice, comfortable, family-oriented 12 percenter that could do tremendous ministry and reach 40%, which I think is not bad. But those of you who have been part of St. Most from the beginning and have felt the Holy Spirit move, have felt the energy of what it means to have something just as a thought being birthed and come to life and seeing God's Holy Spirit move and live, you go, I think God wants the entire thing. 
And like Paul, I think we have some decisions, hard decisions. I don't have the, all the answers. But I think it requires some really cool, exciting, but really scary, risking looking things of reimagining. Like looking out in our community, in our watershed, in our city, in Charles Village, in Abel, in Harwood, in Barclay, in Waverly, and saying, what does good news church gospel look like out there? That might be a little different than in here. What would it look like to start listening to the people around our watershed? What, what could be their concerns? And how would it look different than what we may be experiencing right now? It's a hard decision, right? Some of, you, some of us may be feeling like, well, I kind of like... It's getting, it's not bad. So if you remember a year ago, we came in, we're like, wow, this place is a real dump. And now it's like, wow, this is really beautiful. And then I go, just go downstairs, right? <laughs> Got a, a lot more work to be done. But we can go, hey, man, this is not bad. Even though we have no lights underneath those two, you still get some light from the windows. It's not bad. You know, we get some weird feedback, and the mics and the speakers aren't great, but hey, I could live with this. You know, we may not be doing all of the, the stuff around our, our community neighborhood, but we're doing some. It's OK. And I don't want to belittle that, because I really actually want to celebrate those things. I mean, some of the things that we're doing right now, um, and I don't want to call anyone out, but you know, like what Denise Sims is doing with Alpha and Gathering, that, that is beyond what we could have imagined. The ways that we have connected with the community around where we had no connections is beyond what we could have imagined. There are all these beautiful celebration of ways that God is working. And yet, I think God is calling a little bit more. What would that look like? And, and I don't want to harp on any of these, but I just throw some of these ideas out, out you know, around our community. Um, lack of opportunities, affordable housing, um, epidemic of addiction. And as I say these things, you may be thinking in your head like, I don't, I don't experience that. But you know, it may be because we're over here. Right? Race dynamics and inequalities. I'm just learning about this, but mass in incarceration. One in three black males in Baltimore City will go through prison system. One in three. I'm not making this up. One in three. The percentage for not that demographic is, is somewhere between one in 50 and one in 100. It's not, it's not a scale of like, a little bit, it's a different world. What would it look like as a church if we started to listen to that community? And what would church start to look like if we started to do that? I got to close. <laughs> Let me pray. God, thank you for St. Mo's. What you have done here is beyond anything that we have imagined. And it is the power of your Holy Spirit that has brought us this far. 
And God, we want to be honest today. As we meditate on, on these words, you got some hard words for us, some of us. For others, it's, it's confirmation of the direction that you have already called us to. And for others, it's calling us out of a hard place, a comfortable place, to territories that may look risky, unknown. So we, we ask for what you have promised, the gift of your Holy Spirit that will build our body up, the resources to do this, this missional thing that you call us to, to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that you did not spare your own son, but you sent your only son to die for us, to die on the cross for us.